did not have this obviously scheduled originally, but in light of the events that unfolded in Kenya not too long ago, we figured it was important to take this time to reflect uh, on what happened and also how technology and how our communities played a role uh, during these very difficult events in uh, Nairobi in, in September. And I want to say, you know, I think all of us, in one way or another, have been touched by, by this tragedy. Uh, whether it was having friends, family members in the Westgate Mall during the attack, some of them, I think, at least in my case, most were able to get out, but not all of them were. So this is perhaps a little more of a personal human uh, panel, uh, but you're going to hear about technology as well and how we can improve crisis response using new technologies and social media. And I want to say thank you to all of you for not canceling after you saw the news and for being here in solidarity with our Kenyan friends, brothers and sisters. It's really important that this event did continue and we are here to show that we're not going to be unfazed by this. I want to say hello to the internet on live stream. There have been about 170 or so um, folks uh, joining us via live stream in dozens of different countries, including Libya, by the way. A good friend of ours in Libya is watching online, and Germany as well, and Switzerland. Uh, so for those of you who are uh, on live stream, thank you for joining us. And please post your questions using the ICCM hashtag on Twitter. We will be actively soliciting questions via Twitter. And also, you will obviously have an opportunity to uh, engage our panelists in, uh, in a, just a few minutes uh, you, using your mics on the tables that you have right there. You just press on, on the buttons. So before I, I begin, I wanted to share this, this map. This is about a, a few hundred thousand tweets um, that, was, that were referencing in one way or another the Westgate attacks during, during that tragedy. And you can see the whole world was in one way or another engaged or following and sending their thoughts and, and, and prayers to those who were in harm's way. And we saw also, quite interestingly, this hashtag go viral, the we are one hashtag. Kenyans coming together and saying, no, we, we won't let this divide us. I think it was really telling and a really powerful message. So my colleagues and I as well at uh, QCRI in partnership with GNIP uh, collected about two, uh, 730,000 tweets during those four-day ordeal, the four-day siege, and we decided to see if we could analyze them and make sense of, of what was shared. So my wonderful research assistants, um, Brittany Card and, and Justine McKinnon, Justine is, is here with us today, uh, did a phenomenal job looking through just the first few hours. In fact, the hour leading up to the attack and the two hours into the attack. And this is something that we also uh, collaborated with our colleagues at Internews on because they were interested in the media component, local versus international, and uh, so on. So I just wanted to share with you just some very brief uh, summaries. You can find the full report um, on my blog at iRevolution. We looked at you know, what kind of group, what kind of individual was tweeting the most, you know, eyewitnesses or others. And this is a quick distribution. Now, not all of this will be very legible, perhaps, but if you go on the actual report, it's there. And we've got other trends and so on, looking at just the frequency of uh, Westgate-related tweets over time during the first few hours. We also looked at um, how the perpetrators, how the attackers were being referred to online. What kind of vocabulary were they, was being used to describe the individuals? And how did that change over time as well? And who was being tweeted at during this emergency? The Kenyan police, the government, the Red Cross, and so on. And you see this distribution here. And Equally interesting, and I'm not sure you'll be able to see everything on this particular chart, but the content of those tweets. What were people actually tweeting about in the hours uh, of the attack happening? So with that, uh, we, before I invite my uh, next friend to join the stage to give his remarks, I wanted to say that this is uh, just the initial study that we've done and that we will be looking to partner with our good friends at iHub Research here in Nairobi, Kenya, 
to look through the rest of those tweets because we really only went through uh, 10, 20, 30,000 tweets and there were a lot more. So we will be looking to work with them, coding the data, maybe using, using, using some machine learning to tag the data and, and collaborating as well still with our Internews colleagues to make sense of the rest of that uh, data. So that's uh, it for me right now. We have two speakers. Um, a third one may be on her way, Charity from IBM Kenya, but we will start with Philip, who uh, heads the social media team at the Kenyan Red Cross and who was incredibly, incredibly active during the Westgate attacks. And he's going to share with us some of his thoughts and what he experienced and you know, what we could do better as a community next time and what kind of technologies we might need to do a better job next time. So please help me welcome Philip from the Kenyan Red Cross. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Philip Ogola. I'm the face behind the Twitter account at Kenya Red Cross. Uh, tweeting for Kenya Red Cross. Okay, to you, Patrick, it's their figures, their statistics, their data. To me, they are bodies. The Westgate response was one of my hardest tasks. I've never seen so much graphic bodies in my life. So. At some point, I was tweeting under cars because I had to tweet from the scene. So in a nutshell, I think that we, we can actually have a session with you guys, and I've seen a couple of solutions which you can actually use here. So um, I'll just go straight to the presentation. Social media at Kenya Red Cross is, um, is something which we just leveraged the, the other day. It's an emergency tool right now. It's a must-have tool at Kenya Red Cross. We use the, the social media to actually increase our response time, to monitor the digital uh, sentiments. And uh, during the Westgate, our numbers spiked from, uh, we were actually at uh, 100,000 and it spiked to 125. That's on day one of the Westgate. And we actually got verified by Twitter. The Facebook spiked from uh, about 25,000 to 30,000. So during the Westgate, we actually, um, leverage on something called, we started a campaign called an I volunteer last year. I volunteer is a virtual volunteer. This is a digital volunteer, anyone on Twitter, anyone on Facebook, if they spot something, they report. So part of my challenge at Red Cross, and I think I've seen a couple of solutions here, is verification. Because we get a lot of tweets from the public. Like on, during the Westgate, I think I got over 15,000 mentions of the incident. So it's hard for me to actually, I had a lot of data at some point, I was communicating with the hostages inside, telling me where they're, they're hidden. They were, there's a guy who was telling me he's under the parking with his baby, come and help us. So some of this information, it's so much we get, but how to co convert this information, to know the patterns, to make sense of the data, is now why I'm here. So this is how it works. Um, I manage the social media command center, where in a day to day we monitor the sentiments and everything. And if I see something, I, re I, re I re I report to the emergency operation center. So during the Westgate, um, we actually got the first 17 tweets, but I could not tweet first until we actually verified. So once we verified is when we dispatched 12 ambulances to the scene. And on the scene, we were there for four days. I was there for four days and four, ni four nights. It was not a pretty sight. So during the Westgate, there were so many um, uncoordinated uh, tweets. There were so many speculations. There was the public outcry. So my role was to, to actually pacify the public and issue uh, calming tweets uh, um, just to calm the public. So during the Westgate, we were actually using social media for three roles. One was to issue public uh, safety alerts and also to, to like mobilize for blood donation. We also used Twitter to, to resource mobilize. Uh, for funds, like uh, what my colleague here said, there was a campaign called uh, We Are One. And the We Are One campaign, um, I think, raised over 102 million in the four days, which I think is the biggest ever resource mobilizing after Kenya's for Kenya. Um, during the Westgate, Kenya Westgate was one of the most uh, referred to Twitter account. And I, all the media houses were actually quoting Red Cross because we were actually verifying everything we are getting. All the information I was getting, I was actually verifying since I was on the ground. And it was me counting the bodies, one, two, three, four, and making sure that 
any information I post out, it's actually verified. So Red Cross became the most trusted source, and I think uh, social media actually compounded that. It was easy to share information. And we also used SMSs to actually uh, also warn the public about the, the, the Westgate incident uh, during the, the attack. Um, during the Westgate, we actually reached over 50 million people in day one. So it shows how social media, you can actually reach the, the, the whole world. Um, and I think from the hashtags, the, the, like, uh, the Westgate hashtag, the we are one hashtag, so it was easy to actually follow up with the hashtags to know who is talking about what. And it was easy for our team to follow the hashtags to know the situation on the ground and the needs on the ground. So through Twitter and through the digital space, it was easy for us to know where our, our source of tweets are coming from. And we also got uh, quite a chunk of donation from the diaspora. And uh, also a couple of uh, uh, celebrities also were participating. So it's easy to actually know who is participating on social media through, during, uh, during an emergency. So I think uh, why I'm here today is I face a lot of challenges. I'm actually on the front line most of the time. So it will be good to make sense of this data and partner with. I'm looking for a platform where we can have digital. We, we normally have a fully fledged response team, emergency response team. But I'm looking for a digital response team, maybe a local based Kenyan digital response team, where we can actually activate. In case of a disaster, we have a team. Like one of our challenges at Westgate was during the blood appeal getting the, to people to re register for the appeal and uh, the missing persons. It was very hard for us to actually register the missing persons and have like a reference point and even making sense of the data, the patterns and everything. So I think uh, I've seen a couple of solutions here and I think they really, really come in handy in, in what we do every day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philip. Um, here, I'll get the clicker. We were just um, during during lunch having a chat um, with Philip, who is, re as you can see, this is a, a, a call to action. He's he's asking for some support from this community, from what we've learned in digital humanitarian response. So I think we're going to answer that call. I, I think the Standby Volunteer Task Force, as well as others who are part of the Digital Humanitarian Network, are going to be more than happy to work with your team to share what we've learned, our lessons learned, best practices, our workflows, so that you can have your own digital humanitarian response team out of Kenya. That would be really, really great. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce a, a very good friend, a longtime friend from my Ushahidi days, uh, Angela, who will herself as well share some of her personal insights and, and what can be done uh, during these difficult times with respect to social media, mobile technology, and, and humanitarian technologies more broadly. So please help me welcome Angela from Ushahidi. Thanks, Patrick. Um, my name, is, just as Patrick said, is Angela. I work for Shahidi as the community developer liaison. And I'm just going to share my personal experiences from Westgate and some of the lessons that we learned even as a team during this entire crisis. Westgate is a one-stop shop for everything. I mean, there were banks in there. My dad loves to go there and bank. I've gone there shopping with my mother severally. I'm a sucker for sushi, and they had the best Japanese restaurant up upstairs. So you can imagine my shock and disbelief when I saw a tweet about a shootout happening outside Westgate. My instincts kicked in, and what I did was picked up my phone and started calling people I know just to find out that they were okay, hoping that this was nothing but an ordinary robbery that was going to end in a matter of minutes. But as time went by, we realized that this was actually something much bigger than just an ordinary robbery. Um, as one of my colleagues was doing the rounds, calling each team member to find out if all of us were doing okay, we discovered that one of our team members' wife and five children were stuck inside Westgate. She had been separated from two of the children and only had three of them with her, and she had no idea where they were. And at some point, we actually lost complete contact and had no idea where she was. This image that you see up on your screens right now has been doing rounds online. It's an extremely famous one. That little girl is actually my colleague's daughter. You can see her running towards Abdul Haji, and her mother is hiding behind with the rest of the two children. So this is something that hit really, really close to home. 
one thing we're thankful for is the fact that they all made it out safe, albeit a bit um, traumatized, of course. This tragedy was something that shook all of us to the core. I kept on thinking I could have been there, my family could have been there, my friends could have been there, and even just looking at my colleague's family being stuck in there in the midst of the shootout was just something that was surreal. You're looking at pictures online, seeing people lying dead under cars and thinking, this is something that happens within movies. And I remember going back to work on Monday and thinking, what, what am I doing here? I, I don't understand why I'm sitting behind a desk beside my computer without really doing anything. And this was the same thing that was going through all those Shahidi team members' minds. We have the capacity. What can we do to help? So that day, we all just downed our tools and sat together and decided, you know what? We're going to figure out how best we can make use of our skills to help out in this situation. And that picture is there. It's, um, some of our team members just trying to brainstorm around the different problems that came up during the, the Westgate tragedy. And three main problems came up. Philip has talked about the amazing work that they were doing with the Red Cross, trying to get several people to come out and donate blood. And the challenge that they faced trying to collect information on missing persons and relay that to people who had lost or were not able to find their loved ones. So how we tried to figure out how to tackle that was figure out ways of mapping out cases of, or healthcare centers that require blood and matching those with people who actually had that blood. Because what we realized over time was that there were several Kenyans who would come out. All of them were going towards Kenyatta Avenue um, and all the different hospitals to give out blood, but it wasn't really well coordinated. And there were times when people were turned away. I may have O negative blood and that's a need at that point, but I'm turned away because the hospital is beyond capacity. They just don't have the skills, not, not the skills, they don't have the manpower to continue dealing with this. So that in itself was something that we realized needs to be tackled on. Um, the missing persons registry was something that one of our community members within the IHUB, Nive Mukherjee, tried to do and they had a, a situation desk at uh, Visa Oshwal and they were trying to help out with that. But even drawing from our own personal experiences, the process of checking in with each other was, it, it wasn't scalable. At some point, my phone died. So you can imagine people trying to call me and find out where I am and thinking, her phone is off, is she stuck in there? or thinking about people who may have been stuck in there. If you made a phone call to them and the phone rang and they were next to a terrorist, what happens then? So we came up with a tool that we called Ping, which is basically a multi-channel binary check-in tool, one that helps or makes it easier for people to check in with each other during emergencies. Because even looking at the Westgate uh, tragedy in itself, this was a problem that has been experienced over and over again. Whenever something happens, you pick up your phone and call someone. You know, It's not really easy for us to be able to check in with each other. And how this or ping is supposed to work is you create a list of people within your contact network and you add in their secondary contacts. It could be the next of kin, it could be your wife, it could be your girlfriend, it could be your sister. And essentially what would happen is you send a text message and every Every five minutes, it'll send a text to, let's say, to Jamie or to Patrick or to my mom or my dad or to myself. And if I don't check in within those five minutes by sending in a text message, then it sends in another one. And it'll do that three times. And if within those three response queries that it has made, nothing happens, then it forwards that over to your next of kin. And in that way, it's very easy, just a simple text message just to say, hey, I'm okay. And that's displayed up on the back end for the person or the administrator who's um, sending out the messages. This is just a screenshot of how you're able to add in a, a person or, or a contact, putting in the name, selecting the specific group that you want to add them into, and how exactly you'll be able to send in a message. You can either select individual contacts and put in your text message, and it'll automatically create the ping once you send the message out. Now, this was just our own um, response or tactic towards trying to, to help with the Westgate situation and even thinking about other tragedies that will happen moving forward. But this definitely needs more work. This, you know, figuring out how to help a 
Philip and the rest of his team be able to match people in need of blood and match people who actually have the blood, or even figuring out how to create the best way to match people who have lost their loved ones and are trying to find them. And I think that that's a perfect opportunity that's being presented for the entire Crisis Mappers community in the spirit of collaboration. Let's all just come together and figure out best better ways of being able to sort out such issues or have a better humanitarian response. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that, Angie. Um, I should also mention, we, we mentioned the we are one hashtag and Philip as well. You'll note uh, from the Crisis Mappers t-shirts that we have this year, there'll be that hashtag we are one on the side of the t-shirt, which you will be getting tonight at, at the dinner. So we've got uh, Charity, just in time from IBM, who will also share her thoughts, obviously from the perspective also from IBM and the resources that they can bring to bear in these kinds of situations, but also, again, her experience uh, throughout that uh, ordeal. So please help me welcome Charity to the stage. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here today. Thank you, Patrick, for the invitation. And um, this afternoon, my reflections are going to be from two slightly different perspectives. One as a Kenyan citizen who was obviously here during the, um, the incident or the attack, actually. Um, but secondly, um, from a researcher perspective, someone who does IT research and who's involved in developing solutions, um, technology solutions for this. So thankfully, as I said, um, I was not at Westgate during the event. I actually found out from TV. Uh, I was at a salon. And so the first thing that I heard was that it was a robbery and possibly a hostage, a hostage situation. And in the next possibly one hour to one and a half hours, um, it was a flurry of text messages, SMSs, calls, Facebook messages, etc., from family and friends that imagined that or know that I have a penchant for hanging out at Westgate, at Village Market, and so everyone wants to check on you. Um, when it was discovered that it wasn't necessarily a robbery, a bank robbery most people had assumed, um, I then got a message from a text message and a call from IBM, uh, checking on one if I was okay. Secondly, um, if I could also help them locate additional people in, my, uh, in the research lab who we had not quite heard back from. Um, we just started, so this is something that we, were, we didn't quite have in place as yet. Um, so thankfully, only two IBMers were at the um, at Westgate, and they both escaped unharmed. Um, but like many of other Kenyans, I spent the next few days sort of going back and forth between Facebook, Twitter, TV, phone calls, trying to make sure that the people I knew um, were safe. Also just trying to glean as much information about uh, what was going on, but also what I could do. So I'm going to point out two things that I was extremely um, impressed and touched by um, that happened on social media. And one of them is the use of social media to, um, to foster unity in, you know, in a time of crisis like that. So I think somebody already mentioned about the hashtag we are one, it was trending. Um, secondly, I think it was used, and a lot of us, that was our primary source of information to sort of understand what the needs were, um, what the resources were as, um, as well for both victims as well as people who are, um, who are in the response team. So one of the things I found out about was um, here's where you could donate blood, that was one. Secondly, um, I found out about people who were um, very involved in making sure the police had water, the police had food, they had, you know, every, you know their phones were charged so, so they would be able to communicate. Um, and then lastly, I think it was a way to pass relevant information to the public and lastly to recognize heroes. And that I, I believe those are important, extremely important things to happen in, um, in a crisis where you recognize people who are going out of their way and it fosters unity as well. So, um, you know, I'm going to fast forward to Monday morning as a researcher, go to lab and um, the 
the focus of our watercooler conversation that day was what would technology have done to help in this situation. So one of the things that we'd learned was the inefficiency of trying to contact everyone by calling everyone in your team. And I think um, Ushaidi sort of beat us to the punch in, in the development of Ping. Um, the second conversation that we had, and which is going to be the focus of the rest of my conversation, was on the utility of a solution that we were currently developing in the lab. Um, and it's still in development, but I'm going to share with you um, what the current utility is and sort of what we think or how we think it would have worked in this situation. Um, so basically, we all agreed that in times of crisis uh, or an emergency, our objective function, if I'm to say it like a researcher, is to minimize our time, um, the time that's required to make decisions, um, correctly anticipate the needs, and then be able to, re uh, to deploy resources that would be able to mitigate the situation and thus reduce the damage that comes around with such um, situations. So unfortunately, in the part of the world where we live, we don't really have 411 or 911. So um, we don't have a database where you, you, you can be able to get lots of information about the surrounding of um, where the incident is happening, apart from knowledge that's based on specific people. So we decided to address this challenge um, that's mainly faced by um, teams uh, or people that are trying to manage cross-agency teams that are supposed to collectively manage the situation by developing an operation center um, that leverages crowdsourced data, um, which is derived from tweets, Facebook, messages, voice, text, etc. Um, so as emergency responders are trying to deal with a situation, then the people nearby are you know, sending um, up-to-date responses of what's, or updates of what's going on. And basically what we do at IBM is to take this text, voice, multimedia data and try to use um, considered big data and use predictive analytics in order to be able to um, derive some meaningful insight from it. So um, the data, unfortunately, is very noisy. It's, um, lit, you know, it's unstructured. It's also um, mixed in with people's thoughts, sentiment, etc. So one of the challenges is being able to develop a technology that can pick out what's important, correctly classify it. That's one. The second point is that um, you expect that um, in, you know, in terms of a crisis such as Westgate, you have, you know, tweets or data coming in from maybe starting about a hundred, you know, several hundred tweets to probably millions of posts every hour. Um, so one of the things you need to be able to do is quickly and in near real time be able to analyze this data so that you get actionable items that you can work on in, you know, in the time scale that you're able to actually effect change. Um, the third thing is, um, now we take this current data and then be able to use it to, um, to combine it with a backdrop of past or historical data that helps us in two ways. One, be able to know the, um, the environment in which the, the incident or situation is occurring. So for us, if you think about Westgate, it would be what's in the neighborhood. Um, our goal is to be able to first anticipate um, the damage that's going to occur, but also to be able to have historical data that will aid you in giving direction to the people people who are on the ground. Um, the second one is to be able to now begin to generate um, predictive models for, for what's going to occur, which again equips the, um, the operations center with, you know, here are the resources that we need and here's how to best deploy them. So I'm going to give you um, some examples of uh, how the, the um, solution that we've developed would work. So let's say people send in their tweets and the first thing they detect is maybe there is a fire. So um, from the solution, then they should be able to now look and see, okay, let's deploy um, fire brigades, but also let's be able to correctly identify for them where they can be able to have access to water. Are those working? And secondly, what are the levels? So that way, you make the decision, um, the decision, the time for them to make decisions faster. Um, secondly, um, in the case, um, in the case of Westgate, a second, um, a second way in which our solution would be able to help is in. Um, 
helping traffic police. Um, as most of you may have seen on TV, there were incredible traffic jams on most of the roads heading towards and away from Westgate, which um, slowed down incredibly the, um, the response teams who are, try who are trying to get access to the, um, to, to the mall. So one way is to be able to help um, um, to position traffic police intelligently across routes that will be used, uh, that will be used by the police, by um, you know, emergency responders such as Red Cross on their way to and from um, hospitals in which they are going. And then the third way is to be able to now um, combine that with the information that we already know about um, hospitals that are in the neighborhood. And so um, be able to now look at capacities, where do we send particular um, people who are injured, etc., etc. So basically look at what are the current resources. Uh, and then as people also tweet, you're able to um, modify the current situation of some of the um, existing resources. So let's say um, a particular water hose is, you know, is surrounded by, um, by police or by someone so that it's no longer accessible, then you're able to, to use that real-time information that's coming to, um, in order to help people who are on the ground. Um, lastly, our goal is to be able to use such a solution and enable other people who are involved in every um, response, you know, in, um, in the responses so that they also can plug in, put in their information and be able to give um, benefit for everyone. Now, um, as I said before, the goal here is to be able to minimize the time required to uh, make decisions and then be able to correctly anticipate the needs uh, that are coming up and finally be able to deploy resources that will be able to mitigate the, solu um, the situation. Um, now, that, you know, that's sort of the part that our solution covers, but I wanted to conclude with um, a few other things that we may be able to think about as people that um, continue to deal with um, crisis. And, I'll sort of describe it from a technology um, viewpoint. And um, it's, I wanted to talk about you know, the use of video surveillance, or uh, um, both pre and during the crisis, so that um, we're able to also equip um, people who are dealing with the crisis on as it's ongoing. Um, at Westgate, I think there was lots of, uh, we know about CCTV video that came out way after. but. Um, you know, there's technology now that can be able to perform predictive analytics around lots of CCTV coverage. Um, and so be able to aid humans to correctly identify um, correctly identify suspicious behavior um, through learning algorithms, but also uh, be able to help um, response teams, the police, etc., be able to um, narrow down where they need to be looking for um, action or suspicious behavior. Um, that's it from me. Uh, thank you for listening, and thank you for all the great work that you continue to do. Thank you very much, uh, Charity, for sharing as well your experience. We're going to invite all our panelists now, uh, Philip and Angela, to uh, the stage so we can open it up to a conversation, a discussion, questions from you. And we have about half an hour for this, so everybody stayed on time, which is super. Uh, so do I hear the first uh, question anywhere? And you'll be able to use your, your mic. So I see, can I get a two or three first to begin with? Do I see another hand or not? Because I've got my questions, but Joseph, because it will take you to um, start with you then. Thanks. So uh, what are the suggestions to reduce misinformation? Because we have seen during crises, a lot of information is reported and most of them is misinformation. And so what do you guys think are the best ways to reduce the misinformation? So basically, verification, misinformation. How do you counter that? Obviously, you don't have weeks and months to sift through this haystack of information. The time is critical. So how do all of the th three of you sort of try and manage the verification credibility issue? Um, OK, I'll speak from the Red Scots angle. Uh, that's one of my major, major challenge. Because uh, like um, I got the alerts at about uh, I got the first tweets about uh, uh, quarter to one, but it took me at about almost 30 minutes to verify. That is wasting time. So to me, I'm uh, I can also do cross cross verification where you actually see a couple of tweets, but still I cannot tweet until you actually have I have to contact you if you're the, the guy who has tweeted. So I'm looking at a tool which can actually like, uh, get you a location uh, or, or like, a, like a platform where we can actually have Kenyans 
registering. So once you register, we, we actually know you, you're in the system. So when you tweet, you actually become like a source for us. That's one of my major challenges. Because uh, that verification bit wastes a lot of time. Um, I think I completely agree with you. Um, you know, one of the ways we're looking at is just trying to use historical data um, and, you know, trying to get enough data where you can create a training set and, you know, sort of be able to increase the accuracy of maybe some of the tweets that are coming. But I think the verification problem continues to, um, to be a big challenge, and particularly at the initial phase. Um, so I, I, we don't yet have good answers for it. I think, um, as you said, registration for specific people may be very, very helpful, but also maybe getting, um, you know, some some person who's maybe an authority at a place. I was thinking like Westgate, um, is it possible to use the money, if you get a tweet from the management, I think it's sort of, it, it carries more weight than just somebody who's sort of, um, um, just a, a person you don't even know if they're really there. I think the second part also is, um, maybe in some of these situations, it's to sort of start thinking about how you rank um, people that sort of look at uh, who are part of your followers, etc. cetera. So th those are the thoughts I have, but I don't think we have a, a very good solution for it yet. Um, now, just circling back on what I'm hearing from the two of them, this is a disclaimer that needs to be made, that tech is not everything. Tech is only about 10% of the success of what it is you're going to do. The other 90 is largely dependent on the people who you've partnered with. Because there's only so much that technology can do for you. It's only meant to be a complement. So, you know, circling back on what uh, Philip said, you know, making sure that you've registered people or you already have um, a sort of base of people who you already kind of trust on the ground to help you verify this information. For me, I think that that's... That's the only way at this point. It's, it's relying on the network of people that you have. So maybe what we need to do is create a much bigger base, get more volunteers on board such that it get, if it gets to a point where Philip is receiving a tweet from Westgate and it's from a trusted volunteer, then he knows that this is actually something that's truly happening. So there's only so much that tech can do for you, in my opinion. Thanks very much, all of you. And just uh, on that note, one thing to also keep in mind is compared to what? Uh, misinformation compared to what? Often the alternative is mainstream media, but we also know that mainstream media gets these kinds of things wrong, and, and, and badly so on a number of occasions. You take the New York Times, supposedly the pinnacle of Western journalism, right, and it makes 7,000 uh, factual errors every year. And these are the top of the top journalists, right? We've seen around the bombings and, and the Boston Marathon, um, mainstream media getting it wrong as well. So, so it's a challenge not just for social media. It's a challenge also for mainstream media, and also, I mean, we, were, we heard 911 kind of referred to already a couple times today. You look at the quality of calls made to 911, and those are also nothing to brag about. The uh, New York Police Department and their 911 operators receive up to 10 million false calls or hoaxes or missed dials every year. Does that mean we should abolish uh, 911? Of course, that wouldn't, be, that wouldn't be right. In the UK, only 25% of calls made to 999 are relevant to that particular service. Does that mean we should abolish 999? Of course not. We need to find better ways to manage it. And on the research side, just a couple other things. is My colleague Chato from QCRI, who's here today, and you'll uh, hear from on uh, the Ignite Talk, has done some interesting research looking at misinformation on Twitter uh, during the earthquake in Chile, just a couple months after Haiti, and was able to show that really Twitter is a self-correcting mechanism to the point that he and his colleagues at Yahoo at the time were able to show that you can predict to a certain extent the credibility of tweets by topic. Sounds very fancy, I understand that. It's not ready for prime time, but we are working with a, uh, an institute of technology in India to see how we can create a plugin. But even if we pull off this plugin, it won't be a silver bullet. It'll go back to what exactly Angela said. Technology is at most 10% of the solution. You'll want people on the ground. You'll want the other human elements for structured, uh, reliable reporting as well. So I just wanted to share that. We'll go to the second question, Jether. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you, Philip, for your work during the Westgate. Speak up. Sorry. Um, after Westgate, the Kenyan government started uh, passing some laws that are uh, in the direction of a police state. And uh, today, um, it was announced that they're going to um, pass laws about 
media and social media and communication uh, in particular to try and limit that. I was wondering how do you um, see that impacting your work as social media um, te technologists and how um, you're going to do what you do within that framework? Sorry, I didn't get that question. So this was basically, you noted that after Westgate, there were some laws being passed to try and address some of the issues of that potentially these laws um, may not be as helpful. Is that what you're getting at, Joseph? Um, well, today it was announced that they're going to limit press freedoms. Uh, limiting press freedoms and uh, communications on social media. And uh, that's worrisome, I think. So and I was wondering what, how we're going to work in that framework. So, I mean, basically the policy angle. What is the role of policy here to facilitate the work that you all need to do uh, during these kinds of crises? What is unhelpful in terms of potentially new po policies around uh, freedom of speech and media and so on? And, and what would be most helpful to you from the policy angle? Because again, technology is not the full solution. There needs to be enlightened policy and leadership as well. What would you need to ask or what would you want to ask to the policymakers to facilitate your work, if, if anything? Um, that's a hard one, because um, cause, uh, being my position, I think there are things I may not, I may not uh, comment on. Um, but I think you know, on policy matters, um, I saw a lot of uh, graphic images. To me, I think uh, there needs to be policy in place to stem some of this. Because uh, um, uh, to me, I think the, I remember during the 9 bomb, we never saw graphic images. So why do, why, why do Kenyans post graphic images of, uh, of our fellow Kenyans? So to, to me, I think there should be a policy on, on posting such, of, such images and even um, what we need to post. Because at some point, we were actually telling the terrorists what's happening. They, they were actually following what was actually happening to, through our Twitter stream. So to me, I think the policy should be in place on what should be actually be posted. And, but the rest I cannot comment due to my position and everything. Um, I, you know, I, I think I'm in his position as well, but I think what I would comment on is perhaps slightly different from policy, but um, sort of some way to educate people on the repercussions of what they post. Because, um, you know, as I was following the Twitter feed at that time, a lot of people, you know, there was lots and lots of stuff, but as reminders were sent around, okay, remember, even the terrorists might be watching this, um, you know, you may also be creating um, unnecessary reactions from people. I think people sort of toned down, and I don't think that it's that they were posting dishonest things. It's just, you know, you sort of think through what's the impact and what's the use for what I'm posting. Um, so th that's the angle I would take on that. I think I'll, I'll try and tackle both angles. You know, there's the one where she says it's really important to educate people on what kind of information they need to share and what they shouldn't. Um, and as far as putting in policies, it becomes tricky because if we're moving towards an age where we're saying we're trying to make information freely available and we're curtailing the other ones, then where's that line? that we're going to draw? What do we say that we can actually share and what we can't? So maybe what we need to do is have the government, you know, the policy makers in the same room with people like us who make use of these tools and then we can come to a common ground because I think that's something that's not being done right now. Um, the government is coming up with these uh, draconian rules and draconian bills from their own perspective of what they saw was happening at that time. And that's because there's no conversation happening between the two, the two ends. So one is let's educate people on what kind of information you need to share online. And the second is let's get in the same room with the policymakers and forge the way forward. Thank you to all three of you. So very, a very strong theme on, on education, on, on media literacy, digital literacy, uh, and educating the global village, right, in terms of how they can be more, more helpful during these times in, in terms of, um, of reporting. So, I mean, an open question as well could be, how can we crowdsource critical thinking? How can we help people think through before they retweet, before they post something? And, you know, one area to look is really in the journalism space, right? And often, often one of the examples that is given is the BBC's user-generated uh, hub, content hub, UGC. Um, in London. They started operations a year before 
Twitter was born back in 2005. And their whole purpose in London, this is a seasoned investigative journalist, is to do just this, is to verify social media content, user-generated content posted on social media. And they've been doing it for eight years. So I think we in the humanitarian space and crisis response space have a lot to learn from journalists and data journalists as well. Storyful is another group that works closely with a number of other organizations to verify YouTube video footage and, and pictures as well. So the skills exist, they just haven't really been transferred as much uh, as possible. So on that note, one particular resource that may be interested, uh, interesting to this community is a verification handbook that is being put together by the European Committee of Journalists, which will come out in February, that will include chapters by the BBC's hub, by Storyful, and a lot of the others who are really at the cutting edge of thinking about these issues, but not just from an academic perspective, but how do you concretely, actively start verifying information. So we should also remember the journalists in, in this room as well that can really help us with respect to the digital literacy and the, the media literacy. So Heather, do we have any questions from the World Wide Web? Yes, of course. Um, the question is, during the attack, we saw people tweeting locations of those in the buildings. Do you have thoughts on whether this helps or hinders the response? So basically, all right, situational awareness can cut both ways. Uh, if you're increasing situational awareness for the Kenyan Red Cross, you may be also increasing situational awareness for the perpetrators. Is there a solution to that particular tension? Um, <clears throat> what I normally do, I, I, I actually do dissemination and I tell the, the, the digital uh, volunteers to avoid uh, giving locations, to avoid giving um, personal information online. So I, I always encourage uh, they share their number uh, or, or the, we actually converse through the uh, direct message. But I avoid, I avoid locations completely and even naming the building the location, just give it something which, which can actually give you away. Uh, what are Red Cross we do? We actually have that uh, confidentiality and, and, and privacy um, um, uh, reservation for all our treats. We don't like expose, and we even in our photos, we try to, as much as to not to expose the photos or the, the faces and everything. So I think it's not good to actually, in such scenarios, to give a location because it may work the wrong way or the good way. Like uh, during the Westgate. <coughs> I think I received over um, 100 DMs and uh, Facebook inboxes from the hostages. They're actually telling us uh, exactly where they were, and we were actually sharing that information with the with the police. So it, uh, at some point, I was actually on phone with one of the hostages, and I could hear gunshots. It was like I'm at the basement. basement. Then while we were talking on phone, we had gunshots, then blasts, and everything went quiet. So that day, it was. I felt like I sold him out, you know, as in talking to him. So I don't know what happened. So some of these things, giving a location can also not be good and also, yeah. Um, I think I would say it's more situational depending on, the, on what's going on. So if, you know, if it's an earthquake, then it's really useful, whether you send, it, you send it as just a tweet where, you know, more people than the person you're sending to can receive it uh, versus, you know, the situation we had at Westgate where perhaps a more, you know, direct message or something more private would work. They both used examples I was going to use, but I'll do it anyway. <laughs> um, again, it largely depends on the context because, like she said, in... Uh, the earthquake situation, you know, location is something that's key to helping you match that, match their needs with humanitarian responders, and these people need to find them. But in a case where it's a siege like Westgate, then you need to be careful. Yes, location is key, but you need to limit who the audience of that information would be. So don't use public um, spaces like Twitter to say, or, or to post information about where the hostages are and things like that. So it largely depend on the context. And I think this is even um, something that was tackled in a blog post I saw recently about human humanitarianism in context. It's just trying to figure out how tech can help you within specific situations. So that's something that you always need to keep in mind. What's the situation right now? And what do I need to do to adapt to that specific situation? Thank you. That's, that's, I mean, these are difficult questions and, you know, we don't all have the answers and, and that's okay. That's why we're here. We're as a community trying to struggle and we don't give up this struggle. So that's, that's good. I think on this note, just, you know, this idea of people want to help and, and maybe they don't really uh, realize 
when they're retweeting or reposting images that, that perhaps that may not be very helpful or could actually cause more harm than good. So maybe it goes back again to this idea of this worldwide goodwill and how do we find the appropriate channels to, to nurture and to harvest that goodwill in a way that's productive, that's generative, uh, as, opposed to, as opposed to perhaps harmful. But it's an ongoing challenge and that I think we're all, all struggling with. Do we have uh, pictures, uh, questions rather in, in the audience? We've got Rachel, do I see any other couple hands just so that I know where to look at next? One, two, Rachel and Hemant for now. Shout if I don't see you. Uh, so we'll start with you, uh, Rachel. Um, first of all, thank you guys all for the amazing work that you've done throughout. Um, my question I think is more bringing to light something that's probably a little bit outside the scope of all of your work, but it would be interesting to have you discuss it a bit, um, is the fact that Al-Shabaab also supposedly had a Twitter feed. There were several that came up claiming to be Al-Shabaab. Some seemed more real, others quoted Drake and seemed probably not very real. Um, but I was wondering, with that sort of arising and potentially as a new trend, how would you suggest that people interact with a Twitter feed like that? I saw some people were sort of retweeting and pointing to their tweets saying, look how awful this is, but still drawing attention. The feeds kept getting shut down, but coming back up. And I'm wondering if you guys have any insights on how you would hope that um, this community would react to um, to that specifically. And Philip doesn't always have to go first. Huh? You can give, uh, but any, any thoughts on this? Another, another difficult question. How do you manage that challenge? Um, okay, to me, they're, they're, they're quite resourceful because it, it gives me the intelligence on uh, what is actually cooking on that side. But uh, uh, like, I, like my colleagues have said, uh, I think retweeting such tweets is only giving them more prominence. And I think uh, they need to be advocacy to, because to, to, I think Al-Shabaab, to, to, to them, they look at success when they get more viral, when they go viral. So the more you share their stuff, the more they feel they, like they have su succeeded. Um, I think I would say perhaps balance that, which is extremely important, and thinking through to what extent that helps, you know, the police or counterterrorism people be able to actually get them. Now, I, I, I don't yet have very good ideas of how, perhaps you can geolocate, but I'm guessing they're pretty smart that, you know, they turn that off. But if, to, to the extent that that helps us be able to maybe locate them, then yes. Um, but also, you know, it's, we have to balance that very carefully with the idea that we're, we're just sort of trying to give them attention, which is what they're reveling in. Hmm. No, I'm not going to pass. <laughs> so in this space of freedom of information, we need to be aware of the fact that there will be good things that you will see and there will be bad things. I personally don't think that burying our heads in the sand is going to help in any way. So maybe retweeting them is endorsing them, but in as far as we talk of freedom of speech, I don't believe in us gagging. Let them talk but just ignore them or direct whatever it is that they're saying to law enforcement agencies for them to do something about it. Because at the end of the day, I'd rather know what they're thinking, what, what their plans are, than burying my head in the sand, I would think. I know that may sound like a hard stance, but again, it's just figuring out that thin line between um, being completely open and gagging people. Thank you. Thank you. All three. So, Hemant, do you want to pose your question? Um, so my question is about um, how you fix the rumors, really. It has two parts. One is identifying, and second is once you know what to do now. So two parts. So what, do you, what are your thoughts on uh, fixing the rumors then? Did you hear that? I didn't get so I couldn't hear, quite hear that. Fixing what exactly? Fixing the rumors. How do you fix the rumors, really, the, uh, the bad information in the network? So, the, and, and it has two parts. One is identifying the rumors, and once you're identified, how you go and fix them? Fix the users. Rumors. Rumors. Ah, okay. All right. Do you want to take that first? Fixing rumors. I think that just ties back into um, educating people on the impact of what they share has on people. Because even looking back at Westgate itself, for me, looking at Twitter was stressful because there were times when things would just pop up and you're like, this can't be happening again. And then you see another tweet saying, no, it's not true. So it's, I can't go and, t and gag someone 
as such, as much as I'd like to, but if they understood the impact that what they're sharing has, and knowing that you need to be very careful about what you put out there without it being verified or without you knowing the full facts, that would be the best way of fixing people and fixing rumors. Um, I think on the research side, this is something that we could, you know, that, that, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, that you can sort of um, apply some of, you know, some of our technologies around machine learning and being able to sort of detect anomalies. How, you know, how do you, again, it sort of goes back to the verification bit you were talking about. So, you know, is an aspect of verification how many independent um, sources you get versus this is something that's been retweeted. I think it's, it's, it's something that we have to think about, but I don't know that I have a direct answer to what you're saying, but that, that would be my thoughts towards it. I think I deal with rumors in each, 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 each uh, different context. Uh, and, and to me, I don't jump into spreading the rumor first. What I do, I, I, I cloud the area and look at, uh, is, is that rumor true or what? So during the Westgate, there were a lot of speculations, a lot of uh, rumors going around. So what I did, I actually went to the ground. So being at the ground, I muscled, because um, I was tweeting photos. At some point, there were rumors which were saying that the building has completely been brought down. So I had to tweet a photo of the building still standing. So that way, now you actually authoritatively state that this is a rumor. So it was easy to actually, once you tweet from the scene of the incident, it's easy for people to know that you are there, and you can give a situational update of what's happening on the ground. So I think having factual information on the ground dispels the rumor. Thank you, all of you, again. Do we have any questions from the World Wide Web? No. So on that note, thanks for, for asking. I think, again, look at what journalists are doing. Look at what Andy Carvin was doing during the Arab Spring, right? He was very clearly, when he was getting information that he had not verified or, or could not be immediately verified, all caps, unverified. You know, can someone please help try and verify this information? So even qualifying your tweet with one simple word can go a long way. And our colleagues in, in Australia, in Queensland in particular, with the repeated flooding that they've had over the past few years, have started using the hashtag MythBusters. So every time they come across, uh, across a rumor or something that's false information, they'll, t they'll tweet it with the tag, we've nailed you, this is wrong. And then people can actually follow that particular hashtag and double check. We saw also during Hurricane Sandy in the US, FEMA having a rumor control board, just a, a website where they would list all the rumors that were wrong and explain, oh, this is wrong, this is wrong. So you have a centralized place where people can get perhaps a little more uh, information on that. So that can be, that can be also very uh, helpful. Uh, we have other uh, follow-up. Wait, let me see if there's any other questions first. <laughs> do we have, okay, all the way back there, do you, m we'll try and come back to you, Hemant. Uh, so just, Justine. Hi, after reading through. Can you speak in the mic? <laughs> After reading through all the tweets for the analysis, you do actually get to know the people that are tweeting, and you get the emotional side of the, what's going on without being said. And it was a very strange feeling. But you also then got to know the people who actually were reporting accurately by checking the lang latitude and longitude of where they were tweeting from. And I think it was 75% of people claiming to be in the area weren't there. Thanks for sharing, Jess. Uh, Himan, did you have a follow-up on that? Yeah, I just wanted to add uh, to your points, uh, the two comments you guys made. So it's absolutely a research issue, identification and detection, and you know, uh, and we also the prediction issues. Um, one of the thought, because we guys are also researching, and was understanding this human behavior. Uh, we get persuaded very much by you know um, the persuasion theory itself, which says by some influencers. So can we introduce a feedback channel into the network? Uh, because how rumors are really forming. The nerves of this rumor formation is actually these people who are getting, you know, influenced because they have been tweeted so many number of times. And so, you know, so picking on those influencers and then, you know, uh, correcting via them back into the channel, into the whole entire network. So that channelizing and, you know, feeding back into the network, that might, I think, also be a good idea to uh, fix it. Any thoughts or just reactions to that? It's not necessarily a question, but any ideas or? 
I mean, you know, one thing I would just say is, well, we don't, we're not limited to one information channel. There's an exactly. ecosystem here. So being able to do verification and broadcast it out via radio or television um, is another way to try and perhaps sort of get diffuse the, uh, the information in Kyrgyzstan a few years ago um, when there was some of the unrest, to say the least, in Ocean, southern Kyrgyzstan. An NGO in Bishkek had set up a Skype um, group. And by the end of that day, she had a, hundreds of her friends across Kyrgyzstan who were on that Skype chat. And they were helping each other verify information. And so when there was a rumor that some army was invading across the border in the south, then they, they had somebody who was on that Skype chat who could call their brother, who was actually a soldier guarding the border, and say, hey, is there anybody coming over the border? And he says, no, this is completely wrong. Then they got that information to the, to the news media, uh, television broadcasting, and they shared that kind of loop. So we're not restricted to just social media, nor are we restricted to just, picture, uh, to just text, right? Images can be very, very powerful, videos as well. In fact, we're seeing a shift to a certain extent uh, at least with, with FEMA in the US, towards wanting to crowdsource images. Less so tweets, but, but images, because perhaps they're a little less difficult, a little, uh, easy to, to doctor, but it, maybe it gives you context when you have um, different angles and so on. So I wonder if, if three of you could also touch on just, what about multimedia content? How, how, does, how did that work, if at all, in, in Westgate? And what are the challenges when we get to the moment where we saw, for example, during the Boston bombings, when the Boston Police Department actively solicited pictures and they were overwhelmed by hundreds of thousands of pictures. So how are you using multimedia or how do you want to be able to use multimedia and what are the challenges going to be uh, on that? Um, like for me, if, if I get a tweet with a photo, that to me is verif that's, uh, that's verification. Me, if, um, and during the Westgate, I received so many. And that's why I'm saying, I think in that day I received about 15,000 mentions. So multimedia, there are videos of uh, inside um, the, the mall, inside of the hostages, there are graphics. So sifting through the data, it's hard work. And that time, remember, you are also hiding from the bullets, you're hiding under cars. So to me, multimedia during a crisis plays a critical role because it gives you a situational analysis of what you can prepare. You can know which angles, your, what's, on the, what's the pulse on the ground, how do you approach the ground, how many teams do you need. So to me, photos work very, like um, normally when I get tweets from the digital volunteers, I normally request them, I would get a photo. Because photos actually give us like a preparedness plan to be, before we actually give, give um, a dispatch uh, team to, to go to the rescue team. Yeah. Um, I absolutely agree with what he said. I think the onus is on us, um, you know, people in technology to be able to um, find ways to quickly analyze that information. So um, sort of what I was talking about before, where now you have algorithms that can automate that process so that he doesn't have to look at, you know, individual pictures and try to piece them himself. Um, and then, of course, the second benefit of um, being able to get multimedia is then, you know, duplication is it's, it's, more, it's slightly easier easier to, to recognize uh, rather than looking at, um, looking at tweets. So, um, you know, it's one of the things you're working on, I would say. A picture speaks, it says a thousand words. I think that's something that's clearly evident. So um, in our work, as we move along, we're trying to make sure that as we build out our tools that we're allowing for people who are sharing information with us to be able to share, you know, let them share the videos, let them share the pictures. Um, but then even looking beyond that, I think one thing that we need to also do, and you've just mentioned it, um, is in terms of analyzing the stuff that we get in because You've probably seen it in the past on Twitter as well. Somebody will pick an image and it'll seem like it's verified, but if you do your research properly, you'll actually find that this is something you found from a very long time ago and is putting it in there. So that's also something that we all need to look at as we move forward. But in as far as the work that we do and uh, highlighting multimedia, that's definitely in the pipeline through CrowdMap and Ushaidi, so. Okay. Thank you to all three of you for talking about it a topic and a subject that really is um, close to home. And I thank you for being on stage and sharing your ideas and, and more importantly, your solutions and moving forward together uh, the community. So please help me in uh, thanking our panelists with a round of applause. Thank you. Guys. You're thank you.